So before we get started, I do want to pray. So if you would, please bow. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to bring this sermon, and I thank you that you're using me to do it, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would guide my words, Lord. I ask that you would help me to decrease, and I ask that you would increase and fill me up with your Holy Spirit, and just let me, to, let me say what you would have me to say, Lord, and just use me. Lord, I thank you once again for for everyone here, and I just ask that you would help it to be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But what was before all of this? Have you ever thought about that? I'm sure most of us have. You go out on a clear night, and you look up at the stars, and it really is amazing and impossible for us to truly comprehend. Most scientists believe in something called the Big Bang. They believe that all of this came from a small spinning dot, and then one day it exploded into the sun, the moons, the stars, the planets. But there's actually a lot of evidence proving that the Big Bang is very flawed evidence that scientists have no explanation for. Yet they still will not agree that there was an intelligent designer because then they're accountable to someone or something. But we as humans, we're always looking for an excuse to serve ourselves. But even if the Big Bang were true, where did that small spinning dot come from? You're telling me that that little dot came from nothing and then it exploded into all of this? Their worldview takes more faith to believe than ours does. But see, they believe in an extremely old earth. They believe billions of years. And they think that time explains everything and answers every question. But let me ask you something. Can a watch make itself? Most people would agree, even atheists, that no matter how much time you wait on the pieces of a watch to come together, it'll never happen. Even if all the pieces needed were right beside each other. When we look at a watch, we know that there's a watchmaker, or at least a machine. When we look at a painting, we know there's a painter. When we look at a book, we know there's an artist or a writer. Yet plants, animals, stars, planets, and galaxies all came from nothing. Not to mention humans. Do you know how complex we are? We have so much evidence that points to the biblical worldview and a young earth. Some say that maybe God used evolution to create everything. They'll use verses like 2 Peter 3 to justify it where he says that a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. This verse is not saying that God's one day is actually one thousand of our years. If you go on to read the rest of the context, you'll see that Peter is referencing the fact that God's timing is not our timing. He talks about how God is not slow to fulfill his promise of Jesus returning. The point he is making that God can wait on us because he's outside of our time. Plus, is our God not capable without using evolution in billions of years? After all, he is a supreme being that we can never fully understand. He raises the dead, heals lepers, blind people, and does anything else that he wills. No, in fact, the Bible teaches a literal six-day creation. And there's a ton of evidence for a young earth and for the biblical account. I don't have time to get into all of it right now, but if you look up Kent Hoven or Kent Ham, that's what they do. They prove that creation is real through science and through the evidences we have. 
But when the Bible says the first day and the second day, it means literal days. All of the manuscripts agree that the Bible is referring to literal days. The translations are correct in saying the first day. Some translations like to say a day. A side note here about the word universe. Uni means one, and a verse means a line of metric writing or simply a sentence. One spoken sentence. And God said, let there be. It's funny that we as humans or, or I guess non-Christians steal from the Christian worldview. Just like whenever they steal, the, like Skip has said, the A.D. and B.C., you know. I mean, they're trying to change it now, but the times split then, you know. Um, so anyway, the universe is estimated to be, to be 90 to 100 trillion light years across. For reference, one light year is 5.88 trillion miles. The New Horizons is one of the fastest spaceships at an incredible 37,000 miles an hour. It would take the New Horizons 20,000 years to go just one light year. Yet we estimate the universe is 90 trillion light years across. At least we think it is. How could we possibly know for sure? So why is the universe so big? If you would, turn to Psalms 19.1. Psalms 19.1. To the choir master, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. It declares his glory, his magnificence. That's why he made it so big, and that's why he made it so amazing. But after all God created, people will still not accept him. If you would, please turn to Romans 1 with me. Romans 1, and we'll start in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters, of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, 
they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So if you back up, it says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation in the world of the world and the things that have been made. Paul tells us that everyone knows there's a God, the one true God. He says that we have been shown through nature and the things that he's made. And then Paul says that they have no excuse to not believe. And he goes on to say that God will eventually give people up to do what they please to their sinful and lustful passions and to pursue their own wickedness. If you would, please turn to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, and we'll start in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I think we can all agree that Moses was a great man of God. He did many miracles in God's name. He parted the Red Sea, performed the plagues on Egypt. He led the children of Israel out of slavery. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to see God. So God told Moses that he would die if he saw all of his glory. So instead, God gave him a glimpse of himself and put him in the cleft of the rock. And he allowed Moses to see his reflected backside. After that, Moses' face was unbearable to look at by his people. They made him wear a veil over his face to hide the reflected backside of God's glory. This here says that Isaiah saw God on his throne. It's not clear whether it was a vision or not. Given what we know, it most likely was a vision unless God intervened. But regardless, the results are amazing. It gives us a picture of what it will be like in his presence. And it goes on here in verse 2. And it says, Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. Seraphim are different from angels. The only other time that they're mentioned is in Revelation 4.8. And they were doing the same thing that they are here. God created them with the purpose of ministering to himself. To declare his glory and his holiness. It says they each have six wings, two for their face, two for their feet, and two to fly. God's glory is so magnificent that they need to cover their faces. These are creatures with the sole purpose of ministering to God. Yet even they need to cover their face in his presence. Then they also needed to cover their feet, which once again reminds us of Moses in the burning bush. It's a respect thing for his holy presence. Then it goes on in verse 3. It says, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. Don't miss this part. The Jewish people repeat themselves to add emphasis. Unlike us, we use bold letters, we underline things, we write in all caps, or we add exclamation points at the end of our sentences. But Jews don't do that. It's just like when Paul in Galatians, he says, anyone who teaches a different gospel, let them be accursed. And then he repeats himself. I say again, anyone who teaches a different gospel, let them be accursed. It's to emphasize his point. Or we remember when Jesus would say, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you. They do these things to get the person that's listening attention and to understand. It's their way of adding emphasis. There are only a few times that words or phrases are repeated three times in the Bible. 
One that may be familiar is the angel in Revelation that says, Woe, woe, woe. But here in Isaiah, it's different. The seraphim aren't merely saying, Holy is God, or Holy, holy is God. They are saying, Holy, holy, holy is God Almighty. The Bible never says that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or justice, justice, justice. But it does say that God is holy, holy, holy. So it begs the question then, what exactly is holy? Our definition seems to be used as a synonym of moral purity or a way to describe his righteousness. And there's nothing wrong with that, but and maybe a little lacking. The Bible seems to have two definitions. The second is to describe his righteousness or his purity, but the primary definition means to be separate. Holy means other. Holy means to be different from anything else. When the Bible speaks of God's holiness, the primary reason is to point out his transcendence, his magnificence, It shows that he is higher or superior to all else. That which is holy is that which is different or other. If you look through your Bible and look how the word holy is used, you'll see the Holy Spirit or the Holy One of Israel. We also have things in our lives that have special importance to us, like birthdays or Father's Day which are different from any other day. Or we celebrate holidays. Holiday literally means holy day, a day that's set apart from other days. So holy means other or different, separate from anything else. And that is exactly who and what God is. He is holy. He is set apart. All through the Bible we read how there's no one like our God, Yet the seraphim, they're not just saying that he's holy, but that he is holy, holy, holy. Emphasis. If you would, please turn to Mark. Mark 4. You can hold your place in Isaiah. Mark 4, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, Do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is such an awesome part of Scripture. We know that at least Peter, Andrew, James, and John were all experienced fishermen before they were called. There's speculation there were three more besides them. These men knew these waters. They weren't unfamiliar with storms. This storm must have been pretty bad to move them like this. And while the boat is being rocked back and forth, Jesus is sleeping. So they woke him up and said, do you not care that we're perishing? And all Jesus does is speak.
and lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So after Isaiah sees his sin, he recognizes his mouth is unclean. He said, I am undone. I have a dirty mouth. I'm a man of unclean lips. I wonder why that's the first thing he points out. Jesus says that it's not what goes in that defiles us, but what comes out. God gave us mouths to bring glory to himself. Instead, we use them to lie and deceive. We use our mouths to hurt others, to blaspheme God. When Isaiah saw the holiness of God, his first instinct was his mouth and his people's mouths. And what does God do? God sees him trembling, repenting, and cursing himself. God didn't say, don't worry about it. You're a pretty good person. You're good compared to all those filthy people around you. After all, you're my prophet. That's not what he did. But God also didn't say, that's right, you suffer. You deserve to be undone, and you deserve to suffer in your sin, even though we do. He didn't do those things. God looks at his angel and motions. The angel immediately went to the altar, got a white hot coal. Note that the angel had to use tongs for this coal. Then he flies to Isaiah, and he touches his lips with it. Our lips are one of the most sensitive parts on our body. We use them for one of the most, most intimate acts, kissing. The nerve endings are hypersensitive on our lips, and Isaiah has the experience of a white-hot coal put directly on him. I'm sure his lips blistered immediately. Why would God do that? Was it to be cruel? Of course not. The coal was applied to cauterize his lips, a symbolic purification process. It was done for the message Isaiah had to give. He needed to be pure. It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Sometimes it hurts to receive forgiveness, knowing what we've done and how much we have sinned. Sometimes it takes a painful confession, maybe an embarrassing confession, but after the weight is lifted from us. How amazing would it be to have an angel fly to you and tell you that every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit is forgiven? How freeing would it be to hear those words? God cleanses us, cleanses us continually through, his, through Jesus' death on the cross. And all he requires from us is to believe and trust him. To truly believe, though, in what he did for us on the cross. To trust him just like you would a parachute before jumping out of a plane, if you're into that. Symbolically, God cleanses our lives with coals, preparing us for his service. But first, we have to be broken down, just like Isaiah was. And then finally, in Isaiah 8, And I heard the voice, I'm sorry, Isaiah 6, 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Finally, here's the climax of it all. Isaiah realizes that he's nothing without God, and God cleanses him. And then after, God says, now who do I send, and who will go before us? And what does Isaiah say? He says, here am I, send me. He didn't say, here I am. That would be telling God his geographical location. He said, here am I. The price of repentance is painful. True repentance is honesty and brokenness before a holy and perfect God. When we come, as Isaiah did, humbling ourselves and understanding our weaknesses, accepting that without Jesus we are unworthy, God is ready to forgive you. He wants to forgive us, or he wouldn't have sent Jesus in the first place. 
He's waiting with open arms for all who will come. Our God is holy, holy, holy. He is amazing and awesome with what he has done and is doing around us, yet he still thinks of us. We should all consider his holiness and respect it. Only when we seek his holiness will we truly understand what his gift really meant. He didn't have to save anyone. All of us deserve hell, but he did save us. Let's honor him as holy. That's it, Brother Johnny. You want to come lead us in a song of invitation? If you're lost and undone and you need to ask for forgiveness, I'll be happy to pray with you if you come on this side of the altar. If you want to pray alone, you're welcome to go over there. Page 122, Lord, I'm coming home. I've wandered so far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've tried. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, I'm coming home, never more to roam. I've waited. 